there, this is Paul Hendry, um, just following up on the event that we ran on Friday the 13th of May with the TED in Epsig, um, focused on the new TEEP criteria, the Bali TEEP accreditation scheme. So we covered a lot in 90 minutes. There were quite a few questions towards the end that we didn't have a chance to answer. So this is just an opportunity for me to go through those questions from the chat and also from the Padlet um, uh, for who were interested. So just a little postscript to the event. So here is a list of the questions from the chat. Uh, the first question, do observations have to be live for TEEP? No, they don't. There are three different kinds of observation which are recognised. Um, you can find these at the back of the TEEP handbook. You can download the TEEP handbook from barleap.org uh, and go into the uh, accreditation pages. You'll find that um, uh, on there. Uh, you can have a, a, an observation within your your classroom or online if it's an online teaching space. You can also do a recording as well. If you do have a, a recording that you want to submit for observation, then we request as standard that uh, you give permission for that to be added to our uh, growing library of uh, EAP observations, which we're uh, collecting for uh, teacher development purposes. Um, second point here, this is more of a point than a question, um, having networks of fellows and senior fellows who can act as mentors and observers. We're looking to, to build observer capacity now, um, there'll be more announcements about this in due course, but it is something that we are aware of and we're really interested in um, helping uh, good practice to extend beyond uh, members in the UK and uh, internationally. Uh, the third point here, can we write about a less successful teaching practice? Yes, I think that's really fertile areas for reflection. Um, remember that one of the goals of the, uh, the RAP, the Reflective Account of Professional Practice, is for you to demonstrate your competence. But competence grows over time, doesn't it? It develops. Sometimes, um, in fact, perhaps many times, what we try at first is refined and improved. So it's really valuable to consider those. And you might want to think about that in the context of the two observations that you would do as well. Maybe there's maybe there's something that you do in the first observation that is less effective, and then perhaps you can demonstrate improvement um, on that particular point in your second observation. That would be uh, a really valuable way of showing your uh, reflection on your own practice. What's the benefit of me doing the Bali accreditation? Really good and really common question as well. When you think about HEA, it's uh, the criteria are broader, um, so you have fewer criteria, but they, they are quite broad. What TEEP does is it divides those more general criteria into EAP specific criteria. So um, the EAP specificity is one of the main attractions of TEEP. Second is the uh, observation practice. Um, so the, the TEEP observation one of them is done by a, a trained and standardized observer. Uh, you have a, a very, a, a slightly more granular process where you can look at um, the questions that, that, that you have, the areas for development that you would like to focus on, and then the observation criteria themselves are much more specific. So uh, the intention has been for the observation process to be really, really developmental. Um, and then finally, it is uh, evidence based. So with HEA, you are um, perhaps articulating certain points which are perhaps a little bit more general. With TEEP, you're being very specific. You're, you're supporting your statements with evidence and you're going through an observation process which is potentially much more valuable uh, and developmental in, in specific ways. Uh, the next question, in the middle of uh, FS6, I'm not sure what that refers to. Um, I don't think it's necessary to, to understand for the context of this question. Wondering if by data sources it means re research and evidence to improve practice, or do you also mean sort of student data? This would hugely depend on individual university systems. Yes, and what comes out from this uh, question here is the importance of context. So uh, we will all be using different data within our context. Some of you will have access to much more granular, much more specific data than others. So take a broad view of what data is. Um, the creation of a portfolio is a, is a creative act. So you would need to be able to, um, to show how the data you use meets the criteria, but there's no prescription as to what that data is. And that's deliberate because uh, you think of someone doing one-to-ones 
with students, uh, perhaps a, a, as part of a small team. And you compare that with someone who is doing lectures to very large groups of, I don't know, engineers or something. So the, the criteria aim to encompass both of those individual practitioners' contexts, but it needs to be contextualized. So use what data you have available and be very clear to the assessors how that supports your claim of competence. Um, the next, so this is a, uh, in three parts here. Do we need to reference every criteria and value? For the level, yes, but remember that this is a narrative. You'll be addressing them in groups. So what the uh, assessors will expect to see is, is an activity which is underpinned by knowledge and values. So think about them in, in, in groups, uh, you know, typically groups of around three, perhaps. Um, not necessarily just three, because you may find that more than one knowledge point informs a particular activity. So group them together. Um, and, and spend some time reflecting on them. You don't need to provide context for every single point if you have perhaps co context for an activity and then show what knowledge and what, knowledge, uh, what values underpins that activity. How to show clear links to the Padlet. Have a look in the uh, handbook where, it, uh, where you can see, I think it's chapter four, you can see um, a section on writing your rap. What you'll see there is when the uh, examples, when, when, when the, let's call them candidates, when the candidates have referred to the criterion, they've put the criterion in brackets to show which one they are um, addressing at that point in their wrap. Um, so that's how you link to the criteria. To link to the Padlet evidence, you can then use hyperlinks. Um, you could, you could uh, put in a particular link which links to a document. You could also number them or have some sort of other criterion. So in your Padlet, you might have document one, document two, document three, and then you refer to that within your wrap. Again, that's not a prescription. You, you should think about it in, in terms of making it easy for the assessor to see which piece of evidence relates to which claim. So some sort of um, uh, citation system or referencing system that shows, okay, for this one, go to this piece of evidence. So it could be numbers, it could be letters or, or something. Um, but just make sure it's clear. Is having a mentor compulsory and can they read and give feedback on the rap? So um, it's highly recommended that you have a mentor. Uh, so there are mentors around the network. We've, we've changed the system uh, this time so that fellows can uh, be recognized as mentors. Um, so that's uh, an additional module um, and they can mentor associate fellow candidates. Um, there is a very uh, structured mentoring process now. It's a four stage process. Again, you'll see this in the handbook. Um, you'll have an initial meeting where you can ask questions. You can find out a little bit about the task. You can uh, discuss your uncertainties perhaps focus on those areas of development as well as a diagnostic element to the initial meeting with a mentor. Um, what are the areas within the portfolio, within the, the competencies that you most need to develop? Um, how might you do that? Planning observations and things like that. The second stage is a uh, sort of interim review. So you'll need some time to collect your evidence for, for your portfolio. So the, the second stage of mentoring is a, is a chance to discuss uh, your progress and, and to problem solve, troubleshoot. The third stage is um, what this questioner refers to. Can they read and give feedback on the wrap? So the third stage is you sending your draft wrap to your mentor, them checking through, um, giving you comments, giving you feedback. And fourth stage is uh, a follow-up where you focus on particular areas of your wrap, perhaps those that you have uh, addressed based on the feedback from your mentor. So it's kind of a preparation for your application. Um, and, and then you can get that, that sort of second, more focused feedback from your mentor. So there's not necessarily a number of hours. Uh, you can imagine that reading through a wrap and giving feedback, it's gonna be very variable as to how much time a mentor uh, spends on that, depending on what, what has been um, sent to them. So uh, it's, it's stages, it's about contact points rather than number of hours. Um, and uh, there is a charge for a mentor if you engage one from outside of your institution. But if you have someone who is a recognized mentor within your institution, then you may be able to, um, 
to discuss your progress as part of your CPD. Um, so you're, you're not bound by the, um, uh, the, the, the stages of mentoring if, if you have a more uh, in-house arrangement. There are events happening through the year to help those who don't have a mentor. So um, we're building the mentor pool. We can't guarantee a mentor at this stage. We're, we're looking to increase the numbers of people who are recognized as mentors. Um, so we, we are running online events throughout the year to help people discuss issues that they're having with their raps and um, think through possibilities for, for evidence collection and so on. Um, all right, going to the Padlet now. Um, just a few of the questions that came up here. So these were, were from the group activities. Um, so we're here, we were a bit confused with the con concept of personal principles. It is contextual. Uh, so what what informs your what your teaching? I think that's that's what this is getting at. So this is one of the associate fellow criteria, and it basically is asking why do you teach the way you teach? Um, so we've already heard there's no requirement for um, uh, references at associate fellow level, although it is highly recommended to show your knowledge. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, there we go. So that's. Uh, that's a, a nice, a nice summary. Um, okay, having a look at some other questions over here. Two more. Um, okay, so yeah, some questions here from Group Eleven about uh, the senior fellow level. Um, here's one. Why are some criteria repeated between the different levels? This is a very good question. You can see which are repeated by going to the very end of the handbook. You'll see a comparative view from associate fellow, fellow to senior fellow. Um, the core areas of teaching and learning are repeated across because it's, it's the very centre um, of the, the, the portfolio. You can also see that there are certain ones in other parts that are also repeated. So, for example, um, knowledge of academic and professional attributes, things like critical thinking and autonomy, you'll see that repeated across the different levels as well. So it's where um, something, uh, some element of knowledge or practice underpins the, uh, the particular uh, practice. So we, we talked in the session that, uh, about how Associate Fellow focuses on those students immediately in your classroom or, or that you immediately engage with. Fellow has that plus perhaps um, some engagement with your colleagues, perhaps you run a CPD session, perhaps you provide materials that your colleagues also use and so on. So it's slightly broader. And then senior fellow is broader impact still. So you may be impacting students through others. Maybe you lead a team of teachers um, and you are uh, informing their practice. Um, what, what differentiates senior fellow as well is impact on the wider sector or your institution and not just your immediate students, and not just your immediate team. Um, so uh, that's why the criteria are repeated at different levels. And something that you'll also notice at the, 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 the broader levels, senior fellow, is that uh, sometimes the criteria appear a little bit broader themselves as well. So it might involve, involve a similar consideration as fellow or associate fellow uh, pathway, but it may be uh, framed in a slightly broader way. Um, okay, here's a final interesting point. What counts as observation at senior fellow level? So we recognise that senior fellows um, typically engage in slightly different um, practices than fellows. It may be that you, uh, as a senior fellow candidate, maybe you have less classroom teaching, for example. Maybe your uh, core role is more about um, and equipping your team to deliver effective teaching. So in those cases, um, observation at senior fellow would expect you to to have a much more negotiable approach to this. There are you might be observed delivering a workshop, for example, or a CPD session to a team that you lead. You might be observed um, uh, delivering your own observations, and an observer might be watching you as you observe uh, to see what are the things that you pick up on. How do you help um, that observee? develop and so on and so forth. So it's much more flexible. Um, and again, that requires some negotiation between observer and observee. Um, all right, we covered the other questions in the session, but I hope this has been valuable. Um, I just wanted to make sure that those of you who did have questions that weren't um, addressed in the session because of time um, had your, your, your 
opportunity to, to hear these. So uh, if you do have further questions, please do email them through to me at um, teep at barleap.org. That's teep at mark, um, B-A-L-E-A-P dot O-R-G. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll get further information out to you. But in the meantime, the best source of information for you is the Barleap Handbook, which if you were in the session, you will have been able to access during during the session on the Padlet. Otherwise, you can find it by going to the Barleap website at barleap.org. All right. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed the session. Take care.